Hello everyone and welcome. Um, thank you all for finding time and visiting today's webinar. My name is Tianzi Li and I'm the PhD student at the UCL Institute for Global Prosperity and I will be the chair for today's session. So today our topic is financial crisis and inequality in East London in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken root in nearly every country on the globe, uh, upending economic and personal lives. It's taking our loved ones, imperiling heroes in scraps, and suddenly turning parents everywhere into teachers. But there's the shadow pandemic, which is rapid, rapidly uncovering the limited but precious progress that the world has made towards social equality in the past few decades. Um, COVID-19 has devastated communities, and as Black Lives Matter has foregrounded, some communities have been harder hit than others because of the deep-rooted inequalities. We therefore urgently need solutions that create inclusive and sustainable forms of prosperity, which reflect and build upon what communities actually value. So this session will focus on uh, innovative research and action in East London. And our speakers today will highlight the nature and the scale of the financial problems that COVID-19 has exacerbated. And also our speakers will uh, foreground the impactful knowledge and solutions that they have been developing. So today we have five panelists, no, actually six. Uh, and each of them will give a five minute presentation outlining their research, their work in East London. And then we will have around uh, an hour time for panel discussion and also the Q&A &A time. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's speaker by typing your questions into the uh, Q&A pen of the control panel. You can see it. Uh, from the Zoom page is is at the um, I don't know actually, but there's a Q and A pen, so find it and and send us questions. So before we get started, this seminar is organized by the IGP Financing Prosperity Network. The Financing Prosperity Network aims to bring together the academics, uh, practitioners, and activists whose work explores alternatives to the current debt economies and to transform the imaginaries about how we can finance real prosperity. I would like to thank Dr. Chris Harker, the lead of the IGP Financing Prosperity Network and Key, our IGP's communication officer for organizing this event. And also special thanks to all the speakers finding time to attend and contribute to today's session. Okay, so, Let's now get started. I would like to introduce today's first speaker, Jerry During. Um, Jerry is the CEO and co-founder of Money a and &E, a social enterprise that provides money advice and education for people. Money a and &E helps families in East London to tackle their financial problems by providing them expert advice and peer support networks. In 2019 to 2020, Money a and &E had supported over 1,300 people and the organization has provided emergency debt and benefits advice during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as crisis grants to those in extreme financial hardship. Let's welcome Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Tanzi. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this. So I'm just sharing a screen onto some slides. Uh, I hope you can all see them. I'm just going to basically talk you through them um, at this point. Um, so I work for Money a &E, which is a social enterprise, a small social enterprise uh, focused on money advice and education. Um, Money only provides money advice and education to anyone who wants to get money confident. And we're a social enterprise. As part of our social mission, we target um, our support to diverse ethnic communities and disadvantaged groups. Um, our model finds expert money 
uh, support with lived experience at creating uh, solutions to money problems. And our team have themselves experienced money issues themselves. We recruit our service users, the staff and volunteers, and our money education workshops put these personal stories front and center as a means of creating a culture change where we can talk more about money, more openly and no longer suffer in silence. Money only works to create new networks where we can do this in our workplaces, homes, schools, and our communities. Um, so, Money and E, we're based in Newham. We're, it's UK's most diverse borough. It's one of the most heavily affected by COVID-19 and the corona coronavirus. And basically this pandemic has shown up a lot of inequalities uh, that disproportionately uh, Newham has, has been affected by. We work with diverse ethnic communities and we can see that 52% of Newham's children are living in poverty compared with 38% London wide. Uh, Non-white British groups have experienced hard economic shocks to the lockdown with research suggesting that 13% of minority ethnic workers have lost their jobs compared to 5% average across all groups. Uh, and that was from the Institute of Global Institute of Public Policy Research. The unemployment figures among money any service users surveyed, we did a survey as part of the Institute of Global Prosperity. Um, and we've been doing some research with them as a research partner. And it showed that 30% out of the 45% of them have lost their, had lost their jobs during the lockdown. Adiola is a case study that I'm just going to share with you. She was a care support worker um, working in a residential unit with adults with learning disabilities. She was on £8.80 an hour. She was using the food banks and she was unable to work during lockdown due to a residential unit um, and permanent staff having to be furloughed. Um, she said that I'm struggling with wages. I'm getting uh, pre um, stung, she was struggling with the wages she was getting pre-COVID and she felt really bad and down and there were debts here, there and everywhere. She didn't know what to do and how to go about paying this. So we found in Money A&E, um, out of our own experience of debt and its devastating effect on family life, it became clear to us that debt and poverty cannot be effectively fought through expert money advice alone but that this must be combined with sharing our experience with friends family and community i'm just going to share a very short video with you um, and hopefully that will work if not i will carry on with my speech you're now in the bubble of fear and anxiety um soon the letter comes I don't want to open letters because even if it, if it's not even a bank letters, but I don't want to open it. So understand that you you are in that mental bubble of not knowing what is happening around you. Even if it's a good letter, you don't know. So that fear really triple your mind. When I went to the course with Money and E, they give us a form where we're putting down goals, long short term, long term. I put down pay my rent, uh, go on a holiday. They would say rent area, you can pay a rent area. You can really discuss plan, financial plan with creditors. I mean, imagine already that all through the process of my paranoia, I was, um, I wouldn't have been able to pick up the phone and call the, the, the you know, creditors. Thing that I would never thought I can achieve myself. Money management is now very important as um, you know, resources for me to really advocate to people. Prosperity can be understood in financial terms, but we believe that it goes way beyond money. By talking honestly about our current and past experiences, we reduce the shame and guilt and fear that typically accompany debt and financial stress. We open a door for others to do the same and inspire young people and others in our community with positive role models. Doing this has already built trusted, empowered support networks and a support where communities are building their own solutions for money problems. Um, 
shared experience is not a silver bullet that will fix all of the inequalities in East London or affect in diverse ethnic communities, but building those networks in a way which talking more openly about money it has a huge power to improve our finances and our mental resilience. And that was something that the research we did with IGP showed there was a lot more optimism, resilience and well-being of those who actually engage with those services and talked about money. Um, this is going to be needed more than ever with our current challenges in the UK as a whole continues to feel the economic mental health stresses of COVID-19. Uh, it could build lasting prosperity of financial and personal for us all. So I'll just hand back to Tanzi now. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I really appreciate Money and es contribution to uh, the financial inclusion. Okay, now let me turn next to Dr. Chris Harker. Um, Chris is the Associate Professor and Director of Research at the IGP, and he's also the lead of the IGP's Financing Prosperity Network. Chris' research examines debt, finance, and prosperity in UK and Palestine, and his uh, forthcoming book, Spacing Debt, Obligations, Violence, and Endurance, will be published in December by Duke University Pro uh, Duke University Press. Okay, let's welcome Chris. Hello, Chris. <laughs> Hi, Tianzi. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our, uh, my co-panelists and also uh, to everyone who's attended today. We really appreciate your, uh, that you've joined us today to discuss this important topic. Uh, my presentation is going to sum summarize some of the key findings from a research project conducted this summer to gauge the impact of COVID-19 or the COVID-19 lockdown on money any service users that, that Jerry's just alluded to. At the end of June and beginning of July, IGP researchers conducted a telephone survey of money any service users. Questions explored respondents' experiences of the first lockdown with a focus on financial, material, and social well being. We also asked a series of questions about future expectations. The results indicated that COVID 19 is having a significant impact, or significant impacts, plural, on people's physical and mental health, finances, housing, social relationships, and work. While individual experiences do differ, the interconnection between the factors just mentioned and their impacts across communities as whole make COVID-19 a significant challenge to financing more prosperous lives in East London. And uh, I want to quickly note that our understanding of prosperity uh, derives from earlier IGP research in East London. Um, which offers a uh, complex model of prosperity that, as Jerry alluded to, goes well beyond um, finance to think about secure livelihoods, good health, good environments, education and aspiration, amongst other things. Our findings were published in a report co-authored by Efrasini Sharam Lambus, Zarina Huck and I, um, that's available on the website and we'll post a link in the chat at the end of the presentations today. Um, what I want to draw attention to in my five minutes is the interconnected challenges of health, finance and housing, where we feel more research is urgently needed to understand new kinds of inequalities emerging as a result of COVID-19. Data from our small sample indicated significantly higher infection rates in areas where money a &E works than national averages. And this aligns with national data. So for example, Newham, where money a &E is based, had the worst COVID-19 recorded mortality rate in England and Wales in April, 2020. Money a &E works primarily with diverse ethnic communities. And we know that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, uh, with ONS data suggesting, for instance, that Black males are 4.2 times more likely to die from a COVID-related, COVID-19 related death, and Black females 4.3 times more likely than white ethnic males and females. 
Given the existing evidence that race and poverty in the UK are intertwined, we can anticipate that the current and future economic impact of COVID-19 will disproportionately affect BAME communities. Many money a &E clients use the service because they experience financial stress, particularly problems with debt. 30% of those surveyed were unemployed in midsummer 2020, and of those, almost half had been made redundant during the COVID-19 lockdown. Problems with work are also problems with housing. So 30% of respondents reported not paying rent for some or all of the time during the first lockdown while 23% of respondents reported that services such as gas, electricity and internet were turned off at some point during the lockdown. So reduced income due to unemployment and underemployment has heightened housing precarity and people's ability to safely and comfortably inhabit their homes. Our data suggests that those who didn't pay rent for some or all of the time during the pandemic were less optimistic about their future mental and physical health and respondents whose housing situation had been affected were also the least optimistic about their future finances. More generally levels of unemployment are rising rapidly as, as I'm sure most people in this seminar know. We need to address the coming unemployment crisis as simultaneously a housing crisis and a health crisis that goes beyond just COVID-19. We anticipate that deeply embedded inequalities uh, and the impacts of austerity that have shaped UK cities and London in particular are patterning these emerging crises, but obviously more research in this area is urgently needed. We need policy solutions that address work, housing, health and well-being as interconnected challenges, an insight that is increasingly being recognised by many charities and third sector institutions working on these issues. Tinkering around the edges by eating out to help out and furloughing workers is insufficient. We argue we need a robust safety net that ensures all core dimensions of a more prosperous life, as understood by the communities, uh, are supported and this is why IGP is calling for the expansion of universal basic services. Community embedded organisations will be key providers of such services or that's our contention at least, which is why it's so valuable to hear their experiences today. They are not just experts in the present situation but I think they'll be key drivers of future change. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Very insightful. Um, our next speaker is Venu Duba. Venu has just stepped down as a director at the Community Links, a social action charity based in UM. She leads her own niche consultancy in organizational development, equalities, international cultural policy, and workforce development. She has held several senior executive roles in the charity and public sector with budget responsibility up to 30 million. And she also held a number of board positions in the public and voluntary sector. She's currently a non-executive director at the Kent and Midway NHS and Social Care Partnership Trust. Benu is a co-editor of the Interna International Journal for Creativity and Human Development also a member of the European Culture Parliament. Let's welcome Venue. Hi, Venue. Hi. Hi. Can you see me all right, everybody? We can see you. Hi, I'm hoping I can just let it. Yeah, that's great. So hello, everybody. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, uh, as uh, Tansy said, I um, have been the director of Community Links and in Community Links, which is a social action charity based in Newham, we run programs to help people with debt advice. We help people with employability. Uh, we help people with low qualifications progress towards being economically active. We do policy work, which is a really important bit of our work and what I want to focus on today. And also, we are running the uh, Newham COVID helpline. 
So um, in the world I inhabit, inequalities are getting wider. So when I started work, um, 7% of the people owned 84% of the wealth. And I worked in a theatre company called 784. Now we find that 5% of the people own 89% of the wealth. So we see inequalities widening. Um, and yes, with the work we do at Community Links on an individual level, it's in some cases people being more able to manage their resources, in some people being able to share their problems with others, but um, and they need support to do that. And Money A&E and Community Links provide that support in Newham. But as Chris noted, this is a structural issue. It's about structural and... I don't know. Uh, I think that's the internet error. Um, we can go back to uh, Venue's presentation later. Uh, should we introduce next speaker? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me turn next to, to see back. Okay, let me turn next to Dan Engstein and Hilary Powell. Hilary's work ranges from audiovisual epics supported by the ACME and Henry Moore uh, Foundation to print works collected by V&A and Museum of Modern Art. She has a track record of involving diverse communities in making from public participation in the production of a pop-up book of the Lower Lay Valley to large scale print collaborations with the demolition workers and material scientists as um, elk mist in residence at the UCL chemistry. And Dan is an experienced film director and producer with multiple commissions for Channel 4. His first film, how to re-establish a vodka empire was critically acclaimed and opened at the BFI London Film Festival before being released across the UK and US. So now let's welcome Hilary and Dan to talk about their amazing work. Hello, Hilary and Hello. Dan. Hi, can you, Hi. can you all see and hear us? Um, thanks very much for having us. Yeah, and for the introduction that we'll share our screen and kind of introduce the project that we've been it's working on. Is the screen shared? Can everyone see? I can't see it. Okay. Can everyone hear and see the screen? We'll see the screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is a project that really we've been working on for the last five years, building from the kind of um, participatory actions and film make crossover of film and art that you heard about in our introductions and it really began with a kind of revelation and our own kind of journey down the rabbit hole of learning about the economic system when we found out about strike debt in America the offshoot of the Occupy movement who'd been buying up and abolishing millions of pounds worth of student and medical debt and from there, we kind of read their movement literature from authors like Andrew Ross, um, who wrote the book Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal. And really our eyes were open to, to their arguments about the illegitimacy of a economic system where debt is wrapped around social goods uh, increasingly and debt is a kind of means of control and oppression in that way when when the creditor gatekeepers kind of bar the way to basically the provisions of a what a wealth a welfare state so that was our kind of with this new knowledge I mean Dan particularly and he can talk later <laughs> but uh, wanted to make a film and it's been it was a kind of difficult one to a challenge to make a film that tackled these big questions of debt and money creation that could engage people and we struggled with that for a long time. We started to ask the question in Walthamstow, really kind of asking, is Walthamstow, our home area in northeast London, a creditocracy? And we very quickly began to see that, yes, it was, you know, for meeting the local food banks from our local school, struggling under austerity and, and cuts. And we began to form a plan that we would kind of organize a community heist on the financial system. And that's really when Bank Job was born. And the plan was simple, uh, as, as they often 
uh, at the beginning and, and, and it became quite complex on how to enact this bank job. And at the center of it was this idea that we wanted to do what strike debt had done in America and see if we could do it in Britain, buy up and abolish local debt, in this case, predatory kind of catalog and payday debt. And in order to do that, we wanted to give ourselves the power of central banks and set up our own bank, printing our own money and choosing what we would do if we had that power. So we managed to get hold of an old co-op bank on Ho Street in Walthamstow that had been taken over by a co-working organisation. So we came in as anchor tenants and slowly, well, not that slowly, um, quite quickly transported it into uh, and transformed it into our rebel bank as it became known and this was really a hub of a kind of community economic education within the bank we started printing our own money but instead of famous people from british history and and the queen we featured these people in our local community that we felt well that, that they were fighting the fallout of an unjust economic system so you see Gary who runs the food bank Syra and her family who run a homeless kitchen called Plates for You El Sufa Steve and Josh who were running the Soul Project uh, a youth project that was in the process or had just lost its building and was struggling to kind of keep its up its vital support and Tracy Griffiths who was the head teacher of our children's local primary school that was really Kind of collapsing under the strain of cuts. So the plan was, and we had no idea if this would work, was to print this money, employ a team of local people in the bank to print this money which is made kind of with these crafts of letterpress and screen printing and foil blocking, so quite artisan tactile methods, and people could visit the bank. So this team of people were paid London living wage and people could walk in and see this process and in that kind of process of coming in start to talk about these issues of debt and money creation in a kind of informal act of education and the bank became a real hub of debate school school children coming in to print money and talk about how money is made and events where local people could meet with um, key thinkers that had inspired us like David Graeber who's unfortunately recently died who wrote the book Debt the first 5,000 years and kind of a key part of the project is to challenge the kind of moralizing and blame and shame game around debt that kind of points the finger at those at the bottom forced into predatory debt and seems to neglect to look at the kind of mass bailouts of the banks and a, and a system that's kind of to, in the, the system of inequality. So getting press was a key part of that in order to change that conversation. And that really helped to sell, begin to sell these banknotes. And they went off not just through the local community, but a community that was built around the world of people wanting, kind of wanting to take part in this movement that we were part of for an economic justice of sorts in, in a kind of bigger picture. So we managed to raise the money, £40,000 from selling these banknote artworks, had to convert that into some cash <laughs> that, you know, less beautiful cash, but that could be more widely accepted across <laughs> Sikh society. Uh, 20,000 went to the local community courses directly, and the other 20,000 allowed us to buy up, or, um, yeah, 1.2 million pounds of local predatory debt. And we did that by kind of an intervention into the, or a hack into the secondary debt markets where we bought debt at pennies in the pound as strike debt had done basically. And then instead of collecting on that, sent the letters out to saying that that was canceled. And that was specifically local debt, kind of interrogating that market by postcode. So it really could be a bailout of the people by the people. But we knew that was a very quiet act and we want to continue with our kind of piercing public conversation. So we wanted to explode that debt but in order to do that, we needed to finance this operation. So we began to produce another kind of play around with another financial instrument, which was bonds. And Ho Street Central Bank, which is what our bank was called, started printing the bonds. And these were sold again around the world in order to fund, so that's an advert for them, the explosion, kind of symbolic, cathartic explosion of this debt in a debt in transit van on a site in front of the towers of Canary Wharf and the financial district in Docklands on May the 19th, 2019, last year. And that was really a kind of culmination of the project. And it's a key scene in the feature film that we've been making around the, the whole 
project and its ideas and discussion. And we took that back to the bank. The bank kind of continued. It became again a hub of education and coin making because the return on the bonds that we were making was a piece of that explosion, quite literally. So we began to make coins out of the exploded van. And they've again traveled around the world kind of sharing the project. Unfortunately, we kind of had a aborted campaign to stay in the bank, recognizing the real value of spaces like this on the high street where people can come and discuss and debate and kind of self-educate much like kind of miners welfare halls and the kind of gap in society when these places are lost. And unfortunately, we the kind of powers of speculative finance and capital came back to get us with that one and we had to leave the bank at Christmas. But the bank job continues and it's kind of aims of um, education are kind of carrying on with the bank job book which is out now and is traveling traveling around hopefully and hopefully kind of provoking more thought and questioning of our current debt fueled economy and the bank job film that this is kind of features all of this will have its preview screening in December uh, followed by a release in February where we hope that this can carry on its impact through community and educational screenings around the country and hopefully the world. So I hope that gives a kind of brief overview of the bank job and then we can chat more yeah. later. I can't Just get off the share shop. screen. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> okay, we're going to turn it off now. Okay, so it's so good to have you back, Venue. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So listen, I'm sorry I was thrown out earlier by my technology and what a brilliant project that um, uh, Hillary was just um, talking about there, fantastic. I'm going to, I've got lots of questions from it, but I'm just going to pick up where I left off. So I started by saying that when I started work years ago, 7% seven, 7 of the people owned 84% of the wealth. And now many decades later, we've got 5% of the people owning 89% of the wealth. So inequalities are widening. We've heard on an individual level about the good work and the support offered um, by community links and by money a and e but it's really important that we send strong policy messages back and chris alluded to the fact that there are many things that are interconnected um, it's also about structural inequalities in our society and this just happens to be writ large in newham with covid making the situation worse we know for example that people who are poor pay a poverty pre premium for goods um, and that's a policy issue that could um, be easily tackled um, by the government. We know that debt is more prevalent in those who are in low paid work, in insecure work, people who are living without proper security in their housing situation. Um, as Chris's uh, statistics showed, people who are in part time work, people who are underemployed, um, people who pay a disproportionate amount of income in their childcare costs and those who are working in the informal economy. And we see these factors at play um, in East London. Um, we, in order, we have to face the fact that in order for our current economic model to function, it depends on people living in this situation. Um, in Newham, as Jerry said, we also have a very diverse borough. So people are being further disadvantaged by racial discrimination affecting their life chances. And we um, see that ethnic minority people and black and ethnic minority people, I should say, are consistently at a disadvantage in any statistic you look at. So for example, um, white uh, employment has consistently uh, been at 10%, um, uh, where we, sorry, white employment has consistently tended to be at least 10% higher than in other groups. 
So for example, where you see 21% of white, the white population being economically inactive, you might see 28% or 32% of a black or Asian group being economically inactive. Where you see 73% of white British people in employment, you might see 61% of black people in employment or 60% of Asian people in employment. Um, and you see this in low skilled jobs in particular, where you see black and minority ethnic people disproportionately affected by being in low paid and low skilled work. So in Newham, for example, 35% of residents are in low paid work. Um, we have a structural problem with um, young people between the ages of 18 and 20, being uh, have lacking qualifications and Jerry already pointed out the child poverty issue. So um, whilst all this is going on, at the same time, we have large corporations like Amazon and like Google paying virtually zero into the public good, but taking advantage of our public infrastructure. These are the very corporations who are paying the low wages and then forcing their employees onto tax credits which as a, as a member of the public, as a tax paying citizen, we then in turn pay for. So the issue of debt um, and our economic system, it doesn't allow uh, life chances um, uh, to, for equal life chances for everybody. Our economic system, our debt and our life chances are intrinsically linked. And that was the interlinkage that Chris referred to. He referred to it in sectors, but I also think it's absolutely structural. So what I think um, community links are advocating for, as well as more provision to help people in debt, we're advocating for a wealth generating system that is accountable and fair, where people have equal chances to achieve financial security and where the taxpayer is supporting public good rather than subsidising any corporation that is keeping wages low. If we had this, we would go a very long way to addressing the specific issues that cause debt. Um, debt is often absolutely not the fault of what people do and don't do. That's a trope which perpetuates um, victimisation of the poor. It can be the fault of an individual, but it is more likely to be part of the structural system. However, those who are vulnerable in this system don't have a voice and they struggle with accessing individual su support due to language or lack of digital um, um, access to digital support. Those who don't have capacity are the very people who can't have their voices heard. So I would say that in order to address debt in a big way, every organisation um, who's in this, uh, in this space has a duty to understand the real issues that create debt of, and financial um, inequality and to raise the specific issues and the narratives, but crucially the message to the centre about financial inequity being directly linked to our current economic model. And I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venu. Thank you for sharing with us lots of insightful ideas. Maybe we can discuss them later in the uh, panel discussion. Uh, now, and finally, let me introduce Tony McKenzie, our last speaker. Tony has been a citizen scientist since 2015 with UCL IGP. He's currently the member involvement coordinator at Crisis and a member of the London Prosperity Board. Uh, Tony is the lead citizen scientist at IGP, and he leads research in UM and recruits, train, and mentors the citizen scientist team. Let's welcome Tony to share with us his citizen scientist work. Hi, Tony. Hello, Kenzie. Hello, everybody. Thank you all very much indeed for um, putting on this webinar. And I have to um, say to Jerry and to Chris and to Hillary, um, 
and and to venue that um, going last in a sense, you've you've made my my role a lot easier because a lot of what I'm going to talk about touches on things that you've already mentioned. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. So I work for Crisis. Crisis is a national charity uh, um, that supports people out of homelessness and crisis has been uh, operating for over 50 years. So we do have a bit of experience, um, but we're also really embarrassed that um, we're 50 years old and our housing situation is still what it is today. Um, we've just completed a scoping exercise on black, Asian and minority ethnic communities experiences of homelessness and we're gonna and we're um, carrying out a fuller piece of research into this area. Previous evidence suggests that homelessness amongst black, Asian and ethnic minority communities in the UK is disproportionate in comparison to white Britain. Beyond the top line statistics, many of which has already been highlighted by uh, previous speakers, um, collected by statutory services, um, there's very little research that looks at the issue in depth to understand why this is the case and how homelessness services respond to support Black, Asian and ethnic communities. The most recent study in the UK context was published by Shelter Wells in 2014 and other work on the issue was conducted um, between maybe 10 and 20 years ago. So the question has to be asked, why is this not an issue of concern? Why are we not doing some evidence-based research in this area to come up with some evidence-based solutions? So as well as the increased prevalence, other research has pointed to gaps in Pacific services to meet the needs. Um, things like poor housing, um, Chris has spoken about the interplay between housing, poverty, um, and employment. Um, there's also been, um, there's not been any comprehensive study um, for some time which looks at the experiences of different groups, including those who differ by ethnicity or nationality. Um, so just some of the top line uh, figures. Um, Crisis homelessness monitor and projection research shows that poverty is one of the biggest drivers of homelessness. Often when we talk about reasons and causes of homelessness, people fall into um, blaming people for becoming homeless, or they talk about the structural inequalities, but the relationship between homelessness and poverty is not really being highlighted. There's a higher prevalence of homelessness amongst Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. This is mainly due to social and structural inequalities, including the, inc uh, the increase in poor quality and inadequate access to housing, being a driver for key uh, issues around homelessness, especially around this group. Um, we can look at some of the characteristics of the people who experience homelessness and there are a number of factors which point to them facing inequality, inequalities compared to the general population. Uh, for example, they're most likely to face unemployment and at some point in their lives have experienced mental health and or physical health issues. Um, one of the projects that um, helped us look at this and begin this research was a project called Tackling Multiple Disadvantage. Um, and our Tackling um, Multiple Disadvantage, this was a better, building better communities funded project. And it was funded by the Big Lottery um, and the European Social Fund. It was delivered across 17 boroughs um, by partnership of specialist homeless and mental health organisations, which included Crisis, St Mungo's and Mind in the City, Hackney and Waltham Forest. The project supported homeless people with complex or multiple needs into training and or employment. Um, one of the things that has, has come out of this is that 
government policies can be designed to either address or worsen inequalities that impact on homelessness levels. For example, reductions in housing benefit levels uh, or benefit levels across the board really, cuts in statutory services such as mental health and tenancy support, all of these things have increased homelessness in the past decade in England. In contrast, countries which have more generous welfare systems and access to permanent houses have seen a lower level of homelessness and significant uh, reductions. For example, um, Finland. When we look at when we talk about homelessness, we often look at Finland because Finland just seems to have set the mark on how to do it. Um, further solutions that we're pushing that could help close the gap of inequalities um, include investment in social housing to offer more universal solutions to prevent homelessness for other people and to ensure that people have lower housing costs and more stabilities in their life. Um, just before I close, I just want to say that when I first started working with the IGP as a social scientist, um, the research I carried out was in um, Newham. We've done some work in Stratford. We also done some work in um, Canning Town where um, Community Links is based. And when you talk to people about poverty and you talk to people about um, the struggles that they're facing, one of the things that always stayed with me is that um, people did what they needed to, to do to get by. So people were holding down two or three jobs. Some of the people I spoke to and interviewed had qualifications from other countries that simply wasn't acknowledged or recognised in the UK, um, but that didn't stop them. They took jobs in, as cleaning or cooking jobs or um, then you mentioned uh, Amazon, they have a, a branch locally and they would take any job to do what they needed to do to keep their family afloat. And I think when we talk about um, debt and we talk about poverty, we can't talk about these in isolation um, to the many facets that make up our lives and our society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks to all the speakers for their awesome presentations and I really enjoyed them. Um, just a reminder for the audience, if you have any questions, you can send in your questions through the Q&A chat box and we will collect those and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, now let's now turn to the panel discussion because I know the five minute presentation is just too short and too limited and other speakers definitely have more to share with us. Um, shall we start from uh, our speakers asking each other questions? I know when you, you have questions and also Chris. Um, shall we start from Chris? Yes. I was going to say, shall we, if we turn our cameras on, then we can talk to each other. Um, and <clears throat> I guess my question was, um, really picking up on what Venu highlighted already and all of our speakers today have talked about in, in different kinds of ways, which is making the connection between the work that you do on an everyday level and that interface with real people and actual, you know, some communities. I don't necessarily want to say tangible because sometimes they're, as Dan and Hillary pointed out, distantiated. And then those processes of sort of structural change that are necessary to deal with the kind of um, financial challenges and problems and the, the, the forces that are creating inequalities across society. So just be curious to hear, even though I think everyone has actually spoken about this, to hear a little bit about how you make those connections. Because uh, I think in different kinds of ways, all of, all of us are doing it, but I think it's a really, key key intersection for, for kind of working embedded within communities but addressing big big challenges so I, I can I kick off go for it yeah so 
essentially what we do is we um, we deliver services because we want to provide immediate help for people and assistance for people. But it helps us to understand the most important policy points to make. And then we take those policy points upwards into uh, the political area. Um, but working with people really helps us bring the, that alive. Because I think somebody shared a case study. I think it was Jerry shared a case study. And it's very much, it's, it very much helps people understand somebody else's narrative. It helps you empathize. It helps you be in their shoes. Um, so we kind of split ourselves between heart and head, as it were. And because debt is not an accident. Low paid work in the economy is not an accident. It is a, it is a, um, a result of a series of government choices. By design, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so, and it hits certain people harder than others, and that's no accident either. So we have to try and correct those, that design in order to see, and, and it, we do our best to make the, the, the thread between the delivery and the policy uh, very much more apparent to people. If I could just come in on the back of that, um, I think that's a really good point. Um, so at Crisis, part of our work is around campaigning and we like to think of ourselves as a critical friend to the government, whoever's in power. And um, the, one of the things that really, really, I, I see it so many times, but it always strikes me, is when we do use case studies, when we do have people with lived experience talking about their experience of no cost to public funds or talking about their experience of benefit capping or their experience of whatever, and the reaction that um, the MPs um, respond to that, it's as if we're living in two different worlds. A lot of them don't actually know beyond the red top newspapers stories and once they actually come face to face with somebody who's saying you know um i've kept, been in this country for 20 years and i've worked but because i'm not a uk national i cannot get benefits um you you visibly hear and see mps gasp because they don't realize that reality and i think even though it's very obvious to people working um um at the coalface as it were it's not that office to people who are much more removed from it just the whole situation around feeding school children um during the the half just just highlights that that some of the situate conversations that are coming out from people who are very affluent who are very wealthy it's like let's just break this out we're talking about feeding children how is that even a debate? Yeah, I'm, I'd like to say that. I mean, at Money A&E, we do advice and education, but a big part of our kind of culture is that, you know, 80% of um, our staff and the directors included who started Money A&E is about that, that lived experience that people face um, in terms of debt and poverty and inequality. And we've seen since we've, you know, started that the majority of those people from the diverse ethnic communities, Newham is kind of one of them. It's really that they really feature really highly in the statistics of sort of poverty issues in terms of health inequalities, in terms of, you know, poor and insecure employment food poverty, um, you know, debt, housing issues, they're, they're all really like highly represented in those areas. Um, and, and what we found is that by having those people, having those stories and listening to them, it really helps us to have a really cl clear idea of what the issues are, but also what those solutions are in terms of how you Absolutely. deal with those problems. Mm -hmm. So by people bringing that kind of, you know, that understanding of it, to designing the solutions, we think that's really key. And I mean, you know, when you talked about the structural issues, I think that's a key part of what needs to be in kind of involved in what's our political process or this kind of democracy. A lot of the people that we see aren't really heard in that political process. They're not in the rooms that are, are making these policies and, mm. and, and structural kind mm. of um, 
features that, that rule our daily lives. And until you get those voices and experiences in there, the solutions you create are going to be really, they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to be um, satisfactory. They're not going to be, you know, fit for purpose. Mm. And, and that is a really key part, I think, in terms of really changing that, those kind of structural issues. We need to get those voices of the people who are affected in the rooms and, and, and talking to the politicians, potentially, you know, being involved in actually making decisions that are really going to help them. And I think that for me is around the kind of structural side. And in terms of our advice and education, we've got a steering committee. I've talked about majority of our staff coming from the communities and we, 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 we put a key focus on our evaluation. You know, Chris alluded to lots of the stats and stuff that came out of the work that he did with our service users. And until you're really able to listen to that and only listen to it, involve those people who understand mm -hmm. it in the solution making process, um, I think there's always going to be loads of these problems, but we have to get more of that stuff going on to get the right solutions and, and solve these problems better. Okay, thank you all. Uh, but I remember, Venu, you have a few questions for Dan and Hilary because they're going to leave early. So Okay, well, I had one question that's really important, which is that you know, my background is in the arts and culture, and I think it's such an important um, way to encapsulate an issue, and you've used that to great effect. Um, what role do you think the arts and culture can play in getting across these important policy points? I mean, I think a critical role, but do you want to? Yeah, it's kind of... A lot of a lot of the, the theorizing uh, and, and the research that's been so interesting uh, and that's inspired us so much has lived on the peripheral of the debate. Uh, so Andrew Ross, when he wrote Creditocracy, uh, which was one of the, the sort of pieces that the, the movement literature of Strike Debt and the Debt Collective in America, um, was published on a on a on a very small uh, you know by a very small anarchist publisher. And uh, you know was deliberately shifted right out into the margins of uh, you know the public conversation, uh, and then a lot of the other research that that we came to find um, you know the most instructive to to our early research um, had the same issue. You know it was fascinating work. It was important, and yet similarly to to what you guys have just been saying. The voices of, of these both of these theorists and also um, of the people that they were talking to and gaining um, all of this insight were all pushed way out. And what so so the challenge for us was how do we take this um, this story and this set of critiques, take them off the white paper uh, and uh, out of the margins and try to bring them into uh, a conversation you know which could be more mainstream if you like that was our kind of one of the big challenges so we were trying to design a storyline that could capture the public imagination you know uh, and that was really what it was about hence the uh, you know the, the money printing and taking over the bank uh, these acts of uh, effectively sort of as someone said it was a, it rather than throwing a rock through just through windows, it was sort of throwing a, a rock through mines. You know, it was trying to trying to penetrate to to break down these invisible barriers of the Overton window, if you like. It was it was it was chucking a, a yeah, chucking a rock through the Overton window, maybe. You know, that was what it was, and trying to trying to bring out like all of this stuff which was being swept under the carpet. So I think it definitely has a you know that's what we've been attempting to do is to try and bring it bring yeah. it through into that but I think and we've seen that even in the years not not because of our project but how that there's been that shift in what's kind of things that were considered radical are now particularly through COVID being put on the table as serious propositions and John Montgomery's book should we abolish household debt you know has been given a seat at the table on Radio 4 programs whereas before you would have thought it would be consigned to the margins as well and even in the way that the way we got press so because of the, the you know the image of the explosion things like in the big issue they start with the, this project but then they are interviewing jubilee debt campaign and john montgomery but the project became a hook in order to 
talk about those things and maybe then we're kind of relegated <laughs> to the, as a the, the less expert voices and that that's fine because we're not pretending to be economists we're, we're we are we you know we are artists and this is Andrew Ross said something, the professor that sparked off a lot of that research for us who wrote Creditocracy and the case for debt refusal that Hill talked about in the presentation. We interviewed him at the end of um, it, the beginning of the COVID lockdowns and he's in New York. Um, and he said uh, basically that that exactly what you just said, that basically the, 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 like the public debate had moved so quickly. They were astonished by the fact that people in America were were believing that, you know, that, that there could be a mass debt write off and that all these solutions suddenly became on the table. But one of his big things that he flagged up, which was really important and I think worth mentioning, was that weirdly, like the biggest danger didn't come from the right wing, actually, in America. It came from the centre ground. The, because they are the, the they are the people who push forward this idea of austerity as a solution for uh, of the debt crisis, and they you know that that force of the centre, that kind of hostile, churning, angry centre, uh, is uh, and centre right is is an area where we need to be we need to keep our eye on and try and work out how we strategize to, 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 try, to, to, to try and overturn many of the misconceptions, the economic misconceptions that, that are being propagated by that, by that center. And I think that's really true of uh, Britain as well as America. Um, so that, that's, I think that's where our challenge is. Whilst trying to bring these stories into public consciousness, also to take on that, 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 that center ground, which is, so, which is given so much pre uh, prevalence in the UK mainstream media, you know. Um... Chris. Thanks, I, I did see Tony's hand up too. Um, I was just gonna say, uh, actually, uh, maybe it's not my role to answer Fanny's question to Hill and Dan, but one thing I've learned from Hillary and Dan's work um, that I think has been a really, really valuable insight for me is also, and this isn't limited to, to kind of arts and the culture, but I think maybe uh, that's a sphere that's better equipped to do this kind of thing, it is the role of humour and a certain kind of joyfulness in tackling what are very difficult problems and problems that evoke often emotions we think about as negative, right? Like this isn't a happy topic and so it's hard to, to find joy or humour, but uh, I've been lucky enough to see an advanced uh, preview of the film and there's a lot of humour in there. And I think using that, and, and I'm also thinking about the kind of community building around the bank and the kind of joyfulness that occurs out of community building. And I think this links exactly to what Tony was saying about people's forms of endurance and those kind of everyday practices. But I think that's really crucial also when we think about prosperity and, and tapping into people's aspirations for a better future and how those are driven probably more strongly by positive emotions um, and um, yeah, the, the, the kind of things that are valued rather than uh, you know, the, the problems that we need to fix too. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'll pass over to Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um... One of the things I was going to say to Dan and Hillary as well is Kathy Come Home was so seminal as a film when that came out. And, uh, Crisis started from that, Shelter started from that, um, Homes for Kathy started from that. Um, and it reminds me of um, Shirley Chisholm. She said, if um, a seat isn't provided for you at the table, then bring a chair. And I think what you're doing is bringing that chair. You're bringing this to a wider audience. Um, Chris just spoke about the community building involved in making that film, um, but also to show that when we talk about people we've lived the experience of, whether that's poverty, homelessness, whatever, that does that's not their sum total. If we include them in the solution finding, if we include them, if we co-produce work with them, if we co-produce the answers, then we're going to get, I think it was Jerry who spoke about um, something that is, is fit for purpose, something that not only 
uh, benefits those people directly, but it benefits wider society. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wanted to say as well, just kind of pulling back on 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 on, on Chris's point about about humour and, 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 you know, how, you know, talking about these issues and, you know, film uh, and the kind of creative arts is also a really great, great place to, sh to shine a light on the issue. Most of the people who come in to our services uh, who have debt problems are suffering from mental health problems like anxiety, depression. And a lot of the time there's a lot of shame and denial and they don't really want to talk about the issue. And I think a big part of what we're trying to do in terms of having this lived experience, this peer support, this talking about the issues, creating problems, it, it's about creating a new culture around it. Because, you know, a lot of us, we don't like to talk about our money. It's all very private, isn't it? It's something that we should be on top on, we should be able to deal with. But we're not really taught it in our education system. People generally want to be seen to be handling things and don't want to talk about it. And I think film, humour, all of those sorts of things that helped us to kind of change the culture and start talking about it helped to kind of really empower us. And, and I think it's such a key, important part of how we solve the problem. And even Chris, you can, you know, when, when, when you did the report, you talked about the kind of hope and optimism that people felt. And a lot of the time you think of this stuff as wishy-washy, wishy just, okay, yeah, so you feel a little bit happy today. But the, the power of that and the power that things like film can do to bring that into people's hearts, have them talking about it, is so, it's such an essential part of the overall process of actually dealing with this issue for individuals as well. And those kind of positive mindsets as well and, and changing the culture generally about it. I think it, it's really important. And just, I just wanted to kind of say that, that you know, the film and, and, and the stuff that you guys are doing is just so, it's so imaginative. And it's, it's something that we really need to be seen in terms of discussions. You know, you talked about Kathy, come home, Tony, and, you know, depending on the style of how we do that kind of thing, we need to really bring this into the spotlight and have people talking a lot more about it in terms of, you know, starting to get to, 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 real, to real solutions for these problems. Okay, thank you all for your answers and discussions. Um, are there any more discussions or otherwise we'll move to the Q&A session um, very soon? Should we go to the Q&A? Because yeah. <laughs> we want to give people a chance to ask questions too. Uh, we've got lots of questions actually. Okay, let's now move to the Q&A session and uh, I will read those questions because um, people can easily um, yeah. Okay. So the first question is from Al Alexander Brown. Um, perhaps even with the real progress on equality, there will always be people trapped in debt. How can we get the poorest to assess the more manageable interest rates and lower costs that the higher income end of the market enjoys? The also, this also applies famously to things like transport or energy. Uh, such as K tariffs, access to uh, annual travel pass, etc. Can, can I answer that quickly? I don't know if I'm a, is that allowed? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was just because we were doing an, a, an interview before this, uh, and uh, it, my mind was refreshed to the John, what I call the John Montgomery solution. Uh, I don't think anyone else calls it that. But uh, John Montgomery, who wrote the book, Can We Abolish Household Debt or Should We Abolish It? Um, that it, it wasn't that. It, wasn't, it was just one of those. Uh, anyway, um, she had this concept that um, the, the, the very low interest rates that the Bank of England are forwarding on to the private banks at the moment could actually be forwarded to the citizens you know, of, of Britain. Um, and that I think it was something like £20,000 per household to basically um, get rid of the most toxic personal debts on the balance sheets of the households of Britain at this sort of 0% interest. Why can't, why can't the Bank of England extend that to everyone, every household, with a sort of long-term either zero or very, very low interest loan, because, um, you know, there's absolutely no reason why that couldn't happen. You then have a sort of um, a situation where 
millions of pounds or billions would would be wiped off uh, of the most toxic debt would be wiped off people's uh, balance sheets and thereby you know their own you know the household liquidity would be massively improved um so that's like a really lovely concept um which she did lots and lots of work on uh, you know on on an academic level you know unlike unlike the kind of uh, level of me i'm you know a, a humble storyteller but 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 i thought there was something really beautiful um in in that design that she had forwarded and um it doesn't seem to me having having sort of studied as much as i can about the bank of england it doesn't seem to me that there's any reason why that couldn't be done um after all, the Bank of England is not even allowed to make a profit, uh, so the gov it can't push the government to pay money back any quicker than it can. So really, it's a form of money creation that the that, that Bank of England could do. So that strikes me as like one solution to the Alexander F. Brown question. And uh, if I could just quickly note, I, I think Jerry yeah, will, will be able to talk much more knowledgeably about this. And, and this is a question of ending the poverty premium. Um, and I would flag up the work that Fair Buy Design are doing to design out the poverty premium. Um, I'd also just wanted to quickly note that a, a, a program of expanded universal basic services, um, because of the people who tend to use the services that are included in that package disproportionately advantages people in the bottom 20% of income deciles, uh, who are the ones who are being hit hardest by the poverty premium. Um, so I think there's, yeah, like a, a range of solutions. Jerry, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I totally um, agree with what, 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 what Dan was just saying there. I mean, I think, um, you know, when you do encourage uh, people to 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 get um, in a sense it's debt, but if it's low and affordable or you know with zero percent interest, you're really encouraging a bit more spending in the in the economy. It means that you're you're taking that noose away. You know, it's being taken away from people's necks who are often kind of feeling enslaved because a lot of the people we see, uh, you know, they're subject to really high cost credit. Um, there's this poverty premium around things like energy through things like prepayment meters they want to get healthy foods you know they're all organic there's a premium for that as well so all of the different things that they're having to to pay for are you know uh, are costing them more than they can actually afford and often they're just getting into more and more debt um, and I'm part of something called the inclusive economy uh, partnership which is kind of a, a partnership between the voluntary sector government and the private sector but really the aim is to really look at ways of affecting some of the most hardest hit through uh hardest hit people in terms of debt and people at the kind of lowest the lowest levels and really things that encourage them to really kind of resolve their resolve the debts that they may have or write it off in some way as well is really going to help them to really be more included in the kind of economy that we have. Uh, and and I think you know what Dan has just said about you know the whole thing of uh, of, of giving really low interest loans. You know the poverty premium is about those low interest loans really going to those who are who who can really afford to pay off a lot of this debt, but those who can't are often trapped in debt. We see people come into our services and they're in these cycles of poverty because you try and deal with one debt issue, but ultimately they have to keep coming back because they've got really high interest rates to pay and stuff like that. And if you do get it written off, they can't re-enter the kind of credit market because they don't have the credit rating, so to speak, as well. So if we can do more, more things that encourage kind of better behaviour lower better kind of credit you know way that people manage their finances better but also look at a way that we can change the structure so that there's more low cost affordable fair credit or you know kind of zero interest credit as well available i think that's going to have a massive impact on the kind of economy that we've got and it's definitely going to do masses to save the people who are coming in through our doors um every day basically Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, Chris, 
um, and Hillary and Dan. Uh, we need to move on to the next question because our time is running out. <laughs> so the next question is from um, Amri Pogil. Sorry for my pronunciation if it's right, if it's wrong. Uh, in the New Ham Recorder last week, the paper at the local MPs launched a campaign to remind residents to buy local. This works well for shops which sell stuff, but what do you think could be done to support stressed local communities who depend on a service community, uh, sorry, a service economy? I, I'm not very clear about what the question is asking, actually. Um, uh, maybe it, I've misunderstood, but um, the MPs are saying buy local, right? They're saying buy local because they want to. They want the services around to be stimulated, and that will include wealth coming back into the community rather than people buying from large corporations outside their community so a re just a really small initiative if i see something that i want um i might see it on amazon but i might choose not to buy it from amazon i might pay a tiny little bit more to get it locally but actually i'm supporting my local economy and generating money locally rather than you know um supporting a corporation that's paying zero tax so um, I think MPs aren't saying aren't saying don't go to Amazon, but what they are saying is support the local economy, as I understand it. But uh, therefore, I'm not really clear what the question is. I guess the question is about for shops who sell items, shop sells like real items. Yeah, uh, they can benefit from it. But how yeah, buy locally. Yeah, but how about the the shops who sell services? Yeah, so buy locally. So if there's a local coffee shop that you have, go to that rather than Starbucks. So any service that can be provided locally that keeps the money local is, is good for the community. Any, any, any uh, shop that takes money out of your local area, uh, actually even your regional area, um, you're, you're draining the system of money. Mm. I mean, if the question's asking about how do people who are kind of a low income support that when the local costs are a bit higher, I, I do think that potentially if, if we're looking at, you know, kind of two tier services or products that, that bear in mind that some of the local residents don't necessarily have as much and find ways of supporting that. I mean, I think that's important. I mean, we're a social enterprise because most of the people come to us have debt problems or, you know, they're on low incomes. We don't ever charge anyone who comes to our services any money. Instead, we try and get that from whether it's the local authority, a housing association, someone who's got a bit more money who can afford to support those who are on lower incomes as well so I would like encourage local institutions to try and try and do that as well and I think that will help as well in terms of this kind of question but I think spending locally is really important for our local economy and helping us kind of really build back at this time as well so that's the only thing I would say on that to, to really encourage it but spending locally is good and needed as well uh, but yeah, those who provide the services, I think if we can think of ways of supporting the poorer communities to, to really invest in us by maybe having two tiers or finding a way of charging a bit more to those who can afford it, I think that's going to be a really good way of, 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 of doing that. Okay, thank you, Venu and Jerry. Um, let's move to the next question. It's from Mike Bond XR Newham. He asks that, is there any research on the structure of employment in UM? Nearly uh, 12,000 of the 15,000 businesses in UM employ less than 10 people. A third of, this, a third of those in employment in UM are employed in very small enterprises. There's a huge amount of research about employment and the structure of the labour force and the labour market in Newham. And it's available, one good initial source is um, there's an economic development statement, which you can get through Newham, the Newham uh, LBN website. But I'm happy to provide the link 
um, to you so that it can be circulated. Yeah, I, I could see you nodding there, Venue, because I'm like, yeah, there's tons of research. Even um, the IGP and the uh, board has done some stuff. There is, there was some work from the legacy um, when they built the Olympic Park and how much employment was meant to go to local people um, and what. See, one of the things, sorry, one of the things that we found when we done um, prosperity in Newham is that um, while people had jobs, they, the quality of the jobs or the low pays of the job was equally an issue. So the concept of in-work poverty really needs to be looked at. People are like, oh, just get a job, just, you know, but as I said before, people I was interviewing were working two, three jobs and still considered to be poor because what they were getting just wasn't substantial enough. But um, there's definitely lots of lots of research. I will um, uh, pass some stuff on to to Chris, um, or uh, so we can put put out some links later on. And I'll briefly, very quickly, just encourage people to try and become living wage employers as well, because I think that's also something that really helps to lift people up, really, when they've got low income. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, the next question is also from Mike. He, ask, he asks that, how does housing policy affect the people of Newham, where there are 20,000 people on the waiting list, and the only way Newham Council can provide affordable, uh, affordable housing is by selling off sites for new blocks of flights, where there are a few affordable units does not this reinforce structural inequality? I mean, I'd like to say, I mean, this is something that we at Money Only are beginning to look at as well. We saw from the report that a lot of people are in kind of either homelessness, you know, as you, you all know, Tony, working at crisis or at real risks of homelessness. And those lists are just getting longer. And I, I do think, yeah, house building, unfortunately seems to be one of the, the the best ways that we can help kind of resolve this issue but when that house building is happening it really needs to be the type of house building that's suited to people who are on low income so there's got to be a good proportion of social housing there and affordable housing as well and I think that that's 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 really one of the key things so when we do have these developments and we're building housing we need to make sure there, there is a, a big portion. I know at the moment it's like there's, there's meant to be about 30%, between 25 and 30% of the housing that's built should be social. But I think, I think you know, especially in a place like Newham where we've got really high levels of, of poverty, we probably want to look at kind of housing that is that, 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 that increases that, that percentage of, of, of the number of housing so that it can actually help um, support our people um, locally as well and, and trying to look at a way of potentially making it a bit affordable just like for example we've got the living wage maybe there's a way that we can look at um, we, we know with social housing anyway it's always at a premium it's less than the private sector so I think social housing is really going to be a key way can we look at ways of increasing some of the stats so that when people are building in the borough we're building more that's for those people and is affordable for them I think we should target um boroughs where housing is a particular issue like for example in Newham where you've got high people in public in the private rented sector paying extortionate rents I think we should target them those boroughs and we should say to developers that um, for a period you need to sustain less profits from your uh, your uh, developments um, because otherwise the perennial cry of the developers are if they have to provide more than x percent of social housing they can't make as much profit well i think there should be um places targeted for less profit um and then and really restrict what developers can do but of course developers pay a massive premium into political lobbying to make sure this doesn't happen so you know there are your answers <laughs> okay, just to add to that, we, 
the housing market is got so many moving parts, right? So in the eighties, when we had the right to buy, we didn't have the right to build. Um, 20, 30 years later, there's a housing crisis. I think what a uh, venue just said, unless we put legislation down, so it actually says, if you're gonna allocate 30% of this as social housing, when the property does get built, it is 30%. Invariably what happens, it gets reduced, reduced, reduced to 18, 15%. So we need legislation to protect that. Um, we also need to have um, right to build. Uh, local authorities were prevented from building. They were encouraged to sell off the best properties as well when on the right to buy, and we just didn't repair. Um, I used to live um, in Newham, um, and for those of you who know Newham very well, you would know that Canning Town, by and large, got overlooked for everything. Suddenly, if you go down Canning Town now, there's parts of it that you just wouldn't recognise. But those properties are not being built and they're not going to house local people. They're, it's an extension of the financial quarter, Canary Wharf. Um, but on, on that little bit of uh, Canning Town where there's, there's like five chicken shops, five betting shops, it's just absolutely crazy um, what's happening. We do need to um, put legislation in place to say what we're going to allow in the borough and what we're not going to allow, not just Newham, in, in, uh, across the UK, across the UK. I know, Tianzi, we've got to wrap up, but I just wanted to briefly mention uh, my colleague Josh Ryan Collins' work. He's a colleague in uh, IIPP at UCL and uh, wrote a book in the same series as John Montgomery called Why Can't You Afford a House? And he points to a whole series of problems um, with the housing system that are kind of national and indeed arguably international. Uh, he wrote an, art an article in The Guardian last week where he argued that when you continue to pump money into a, a system where the supply is finite, the price of that asset is just going to keep going up. Um, and I think it points to not just the need for policy change, but real significant cultural change around how we think about housing, moving away from housing as a financial asset towards, uh, you know, a basic uh, a sphere of dominance for subsistence. Um, and, and obviously that does take a lot, that, that kind of cultural change is going to take a lot of work. Sorry, Chris, but I, you just, housing should be a human right. It is not a human right in the UK, and it's that simple. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I ha I really need to stop here. <laughs> I I noticed there are still two questions. Maybe we can email uh, the answers maybe to them. Okay. So. I really need to conclude because we are running out of time. So let me conclude by thanking all of our members of the panel for uh, really excellent insights onto the questions that was raised. Uh, thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, feedbacks, please email Chris, um, Kay or me, and also the panel members for more information. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope you all stay healthy, stay positive, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.